Chapter One of Washington Irving's Visit to England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Washington Irving's Visit to England by Washington Irving. Chapter One The Voyage. Ships, ships, I will decry you amidst the main. I will come and try you what you are protecting and projecting. What's your end and aim? One goes abroad for merchandise and trading. Another stays to keep his country from invading. A third is coming home with rich and wealthy lading. Hello, my fancy, whither wilt thou go? Old Poem To an American visiting Europe, the long voyage he has to make is an excellent preparative. The temporary absence of worldly scenes and employments produces a state of mind peculiarly fitted to receive new and vivid impressions the vast space of waters that separate the hemispheres is like a blank page in existence there is no gradual transition by which as in europe the features and population of one country blend almost imperceptibly with those of another from the moment you lose sight of the land you have left all is vacancy until you step on the opposite shore and are launched at once into the bustle and novelties of another world. In traveling by land, there is a continuity of scene, and a connected succession of persons and incidents that carry on the story of life, and lessen the effect of absence and separation. We drag, it is true, a lengthening chain at each remove of our pilgrimage, but the chain is unbroken. We can trace it back link by link, and we feel that the last still grapples us to home. But a wide sea voyage severs us at once. It makes us conscious of being cast loose from the secure anchorage of settled life, and sent adrift upon a doubtful world. It interposes a gulf, not merely imaginary, but real, between us and our homes. A gulf, subject to tempest and fear and uncertainty rendering distance palpable and return precarious such at least was the case with myself as i saw the last blue lines of my native land fade away like a cloud in the horizon it seemed as if i had closed one volume of the world and its concerns and had time for meditation before i opened another that land too now vanishing from my view which contained all most dear to me in life what vicissitudes might occur in it, what changes might take place in me, before I should visit it again. Who can tell, when he sets forth to wander, whether he may be driven by the uncertain currents of existence, or when he may return, or whether it may be ever his lot to revisit the scenes of his childhood? I said that at sea all is vacancy. I should correct the impression. To one given to daydreaming, and fond of losing himself in reveries a sea voyage is full of subjects for meditation but then there are the wonders of the deep and of the air and rather tend to abstract the mind from worldly themes i delighted to loll over the quarter railing or climb to the main top of a calm day and mused for hours together on the tranquil bosom of a summer's sea to gaze upon the piles of golden clouds just peering above the horizon fancy them some fairy realms, and people them with a creation of my own, to watch the gentle, undulating billows rolling their silver volumes, as if to die away on those happy shores. There was a delicious sensation of mingled security and awe with which I looked down, from my giddy height, on the monsters of the deep at their uncouth gambols, shoals of porpoises tumbling about the bow of the ship, the grampus, slowly heaving his huge form above the surface or the ravenous shark darting like a spectre through the blue waters 
my imagination would conjure up all that I had heard or read of the watery world beneath me, of the finny herds that roam its fathomless valleys, of the shapeless monsters that lurked among the very foundations of the earth, and of those wild phantasms that swell the tales of fishermen and sailors. Sometimes a distant sail, gliding along the edge of the ocean, would be another theme of idle speculation. How interesting this fragment of a world, hastening to rejoin the great mass of existence! What a glorious monument of human invention, which has in a manner triumphed over wind and wave, has brought the ends of the world into communion, has established an interchange of blessings, pouring into the sterile regions of the north all the luxuries of the south, has diffused the light of knowledge and the charities of cultivated life, and is thus bound together those scattered portions of the human race, between which nature seemed to have thrown an insurmountable barrier. We one day decried some shapeless object drifting at a distance. At sea, everything that breaks the monotony of the surrounding expanse attracts attention. It proved to be the mast of a ship that must have been completely wrecked, but there were the remains of handkerchiefs, by which some of the crew had fastened themselves to this spar, to prevent their being washed off by the waves. There was no trace by which the name of the ship could be ascertained. The wreck had evidently drifted about for many months. Clusters of shellfish had fastened about it, and long seaweeds flaunted at its sides. But where, thought I, is the crew? Their struggle has long been over. They have gone down amidst the roar of the tempest. Their bones lie whitening among the caverns of the deep. Silence, oblivion, like the waves, have closed over them, and no one can tell the story of their end. What sighs have been wafted over that ship? What prayers offered up at the deserted fireside of home? How often has the mistress, the wife, the mother, pored over the daily news to catch some casual intelligence of this rover of the deep? How has expectation darkened into anxiety, anxiety into dread, and dread into despair? Alas, not one memento may ever return for love to cherish. All that may ever be known is that she sailed from her port and was never heard of more. The sight of this wreck, as usual, gave rise to many dismal anecdotes. This was particularly the case in the evening, when the weather, which had hitherto been fair, began to look wild and threatening, and gave indications of one of those sudden storms that will sometimes break in upon the serenity of a summer voyage. As we sat round the dull light of a lamp, in the cabin that made the gloom more ghastly every one had his tale of shipwreck and disaster i was particularly struck with a short one related by the captain as i was once sailing said he in a fine stout ship across the banks of newfoundland one of those heavy fogs that prevail in those parts rendered it impossible for us to see far ahead even in the daytime but at night the weather was so thick that we could not distinguish any object at twice the length of the ship. I kept lights at the masthead, and a constant watch forward to look out for fishing smacks, which are accustomed to anchor over the banks. The wind was blowing a smacking breeze, and we were going at a great rate through the water. Suddenly the watch gave the alarm of, A sail ahead! It was scarcely uttered before we were upon her. She was a small schooner, an anchor, with her broadside toward us. The crew were all asleep, and had neglected to hoist a light. We struck her just amidships. The force, the size, and weight of our vessel bore her down below the waves. We passed over her, and were hurrying on our course. As the crashing wreck was sinking beneath us, I had a glimpse of two or three half-naked wretches rushing from her cabin. They had just started from their beds, to be swallowed, shrieking by the waves. I heard their drowning cry mingling with the wind. The blast that bore it to our ears swept us out of all further hearing. I shall never forget that cry. It was some time before we could put the ship about. She was under such headway. We returned, as nearly as we could guess, to the place where the smack had anchored. 
we cruised about for several hours in the dense fog we fired signal guns and listened if we might hear the hello of any survivors but all was silent we never saw or heard anything of them more i confess these stories for a time put an end to all my fine fancies the storm increased with the night the sea was lashed into tremendous confusion there was a fearful sullen sound of rushing waves and broken surges deep called unto deep at times the black volume of clouds overhead seemed rent asunder by flashes of lightning which quivered along the foaming billows and made the succeeding darkness doubly terrible the thunders bellowed over the wild waste of waters and were echoed and prolonged by the mountain waves as i saw the ship staggering and plunging among these roaring caverns it seemed miraculous that she regained her balance or preserved her buoyancy her yards would dip into the water her bow was almost buried beneath the waves sometimes an impending surge appeared ready to overwhelm her and nothing but a dexterous movement of the helm preserved her from the shock when i retired to my cabin the awful scene still followed me the whistling of the wind through the rigging sounded like funereal wailings the creaking of the masts the straining and groaning of bulkheads as the ship labored in the weltering sea were frightful as i heard the waves rushing along the side of the ship and roaring in my very ear it seemed as if death were raging around this floating prison seeking for his prey the mere starting of a nail the yawning of a seam might give him entrance a fine day however with a tranquil sea and favoring breeze soon put all the dismal reflections to flight it is impossible to resist the gladdening influence of fine weather and fair wind at sea when the ship is decked out in all her canvas every sail swelled and careering gaily over the curling waves how lofty how gallant she appears how she seems to lord it over the deep i might fill a volume with the reveries of a sea voyage for with me it is almost a continual reverie but it is time to get to shore it was a fine sunny morning when the thrilling cry of land was given from the masthead none but those who have experienced it can form an idea of the delicious throng of sensations which rushed into an american's bosom when he first comes in sight of europe there is a volume of associations with the very name it is the land of promise teeming with everything of which his childhood has heard or on which his studious years have pondered from that time until the moment of arrival it was all feverish excitement the ships of war the proud like guardian giants along the coast the headlands of ireland stretching out into the channel the welsh mountains towering into the clouds all were objects of intense interest as we sailed up the mersey i reconnoitred the shores with the telescope my eye dwelt with delight on neat cottages with their trim shrubberies and green grass plots i saw the mouldering ruin of an abbey overrun with ivy and the taper spire of a village church rising from the brow of a neighboring hill all were characteristic of england the tide and wind were so favorable that the ship was enabled to come at once to her pier it was thronged with people some idle lookers-on others eager expectants of friends or relations i could distinguish the merchant to whom the ship was consigned i knew him by his calculating brow and restless air his hands were thrust into his pockets he was whistling thoughtfully and walking to and fro a small space having been accorded him by the crowd in deference to his temporary importance there were repeated cheerings and salutations interchanged between the shore and the ship his friends happened to recognize each other i particularly noticed one young woman of humble dress but interesting demeanor she was leaning forward from among the crowd her eye hurried over the ship as it neared the shore to catch some wished-for countenance she seemed disappointed and sad when i heard a faint voice call her name it was from a poor sailor who had been ill all the voyage and had excited the sympathy of every one on board when the weather was fine his messmates had spread a mattress for him 
on deck in the shade but of late his illness had so increased that he had taken to his hammock and only breathed the wish that he might see his wife before he died he had been helped on deck as we came up the river and was now leaning against the shrouds with a countenance so wasted so pale so ghastly that it was no wonder even the eye of affection did not recognize him but at the sound of his voice her eye darted on his features it read at once a whole volume of sorrow she clasped her hands uttered a faint shriek and stood wringing them in silent agony all now was hurry and bustle the meeting of acquaintances the greetings of friends the consultations of men of business i alone was solitary and idle i had no friend to meet no cheering to receive i stepped upon the land of my forefathers but felt that i was a stranger in the land end of chapter one recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Chapter 2 of Washington Irving's Visit to England by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Roscoe. In the service of mankind to be, a guardian god below, still to employ the mind's brave ardor in heroic aims, such as may raise us o'er the groveling herd, and make us shine forever, that is life. Thompson One of the first places to which a stranger is taken in Liverpool is the Athenaeum. It is established on a liberal and judicious plan. It contains a good library and spacious reading room, and is the great literary resort of the place. Go there at what hour you may, you are sure to find it filled with grave-looking personages, deeply absorbed in the study of newspapers. As I was once visiting this haunt of the learned, my attention was attracted to a person just entering the room. He was advanced in life, tall, and of a form that might once have been commanding, but it was a little bowed by time perhaps by care. He had a noble Roman style of countenance, a head that would have pleased a painter, and though some slight furrows on his brow showed that wasting thought had been busy there, yet his eye beamed with the fire of a poetic soul. There was something in his whole appearance that indicated a being of a different order from the bustling race round him. I inquired his name, and was informed that it was Roscoe, I drew back with an involuntary feeling of veneration. This, then, was an author of celebrity. This was one of those men whose voices have gone forth to the ends of the earth, with whose minds I have communed even in the solitudes of America. Accustomed, as we are in our country, to know European writers only by their works, we cannot conceive of them as of other men, engrossed by trivial or sordid pursuits and jostling with the crowd of common minds in the dusty paths of life. They pass before our imaginations like superior beings, radiant with the emanations of their genius, and surrounded by a halo of literary glory. To find, therefore, the elegant historian of the Medici mingling among the busy sons of traffic, at first shocked my poetical ideas. But it is from the very circumstances and situation in which he has been placed, that Mr. Roscoe derives his highest claims to admiration. It is interesting to notice how some minds seem almost to create themselves, springing up under every disadvantage, and working their solitary but irresistible way through a thousand obstacles. Nature seems to delight in disappointing the assiduities of art, with which it would rear legitimate dullness to maturity, and to glory in the vigor and luxuriance of her chance productions. She scatters the seeds of genius to the winds, and though some may perish among the stony places of the world, and some be choked by the thorns and brambles of early adversity, 
yet others will now and then strike root even in the clefts of the rock struggle bravely up into sunshine and spread over their sterile birthplace all the beauties of vegetation such has been the case with mr roscoe born in a place apparently ungenial to the growth of literary talent in the very market-place of trade without fortune family connections or patronage self-prompted self-sustained and almost self-taught he has conquered every obstacle achieved his way to eminence and having become one of the ornaments of the nation has turned the whole force of his talents and influence to advance and embellish his native town indeed it is this last trait in his character which has given him the greatest interest in my eyes and induced me particularly to point him out to my countrymen eminent as are his literary merits he is but one among the many distinguished authors of this intellectual nation they however in general live but for their own fame for their own pleasures their private history presents no lesson to the world or perhaps a humiliating one of human frailty or inconsistency at best they are prone to steal away from the bustle and commonplace of busy existence to indulge in the selfishness of littered ease and to revel in scenes of mental but exclusive enjoyment mr roscoe on the contrary has claimed none of the accorded privileges of talent he has shut himself up in no garden of thought nor elysium of fancy but has gone forth into the highways and thoroughfares of life he has planted bowers by the wayside for the refreshment of the pilgrim and the sojourner and has opened pure fountains where the laboring man may turn aside from the dust and heat of the day and drink of the living streams of knowledge there is a daily beauty in his life on which mankind may meditate and grow better it exhibits no lofty and almost useless because inimitable example of excellence but presents a picture of active yet simple and imitable virtues which are within every man's reach but which unfortunately are not exercised by many or this world would be a paradise but his private life is peculiarly worthy the attention of the citizens of our young and busy country for literature and the elegant arts must grow up side by side with the coarser plants of daily necessity and must depend for their culture not on the exclusive devotion of time and wealth or the quickening rays of titled patronage but on hours and seasons snatched from the purest of worldly interests by intelligent and public-spirited individuals he has shown how much may be done for a place in hours of leisure by one master spirit and how completely it can give its own impress to surrounding objects like his own lorenzo de Mici, on whom he seems to have fixed his eye as on a pure model of antiquity he has interwoven the history of his life with the history of his native town and has made the foundation of his fame the monuments of his virtues wherever you go in liverpool you perceive traces of his footsteps in all that is elegant and liberal he found the tide of wealth flowing merely in the channels of traffic he has diverted from it invigorating rills to refresh the garden of literature by his own example and constant exertions he has effected that union of commerce and the intellectual pursuits so eloquently recommended in one of his latest writings footnote address on the opening of the liverpool institution and has practically proved how beautifully they may be brought to harmonize and to benefit each other the noble institutions for literary and scientific purposes which reflect such credit on liverpool and are giving such an impulse to the public mind have mostly been originated and have all been effectively promoted by mr roscoe and when we consider the rapidly increasing opulence and magnitude of that town which promises to vie in commercial importance with the metropolis it will be perceived that in awakening an ambition of mental improvement among its inhabitants he has effected a great benefit to the cause of british literature in america we know mr roscoe only as the author in liverpool he is spoken of as the banker and i was told of his having been unfortunate in business i could not pity him as i heard some rich men do i considered him far above the reach of pity those who live only for the world 
and in the world, may be cast down by the frowns of adversity. But a man like Roscoe is not to be overcome by the reverses of fortune. They do but drive him, and upon the resources of his own mind, to the superior society of his own thoughts, which the best of men are apt sometimes to neglect, and to roam abroad in search of less worthy associates. He is independent of the world around him. He lives with antiquity, and with posterity, with antiquity in the sweet communion of studious retirement, and with posterity in the generous aspirings after future renown. The solitude of such a mind is its state of highest enjoyment. It is then visited by those elevated meditations which are the proper ailment of noble souls, and are, like manna, sent from heaven in the wilderness of this world. While my feelings were yet alive on the subject, it was my fortune to light on further traces of Mr. Roscoe. I was riding out with a gentleman to view the environs of Liverpool, when he turned off through a gate into some ornamented grounds. After riding a short distance, we came to a spacious mansion of free stone, built in the Grecian style. It was not in the purest style, yet it had an air of elegance, and the situation was delightful. A fine lawn sloped away from it, studded with clumps of trees, so disposed as to break a soft fertile country into a variety of landscapes. The Mersey was seen winding a broad quiet sheet of water through an expanse of green meadow land, while the Welsh mountains, blended with clouds, melting into distance, bordered the horizon. This was Roscoe's favorite residence during the days of his prosperity. It had been the seat of elegant hospitality and literary retirement. The house was now silent and deserted. I saw the windows of the study, which looked out upon the soft scenery I have mentioned. The windows were closed, the library was gone. Two or three ill-favored beings were loitering about the place, whom I fancy pictured into retainers of the law. It was like visiting some classic fountain that had once welled its pure waters in a sacred shade, but finding it dry and dusty, with the lizard and the toad brooding over the shattered marbles. I inquired after the fate of Mr. Roscoe's library, which had consisted of scarce and foreign books, for many of which he had drawn the materials for his Italian histories. It had passed under the hammer of the auctioneer, and was dispersed about the country. The good people of the vicinity thronged like wreckers to get some part of the noble vessel that had been driven on shore. Did such a scene admit of ludicrous associations, we might imagine something whimsical in this strange eruption in the regions of learning. Pygmies rummaging the armory of a giant, and contending for the possession of weapons which they could not wield. We might picture to ourselves some knot of speculators, debating with calculating brow over the quaint binding and illuminated margin of an obsolete author, of the air of intense but baffled sagacity with which some successful purchaser attempted to dive into the black-letter bargain he had secured. It is a beautiful incident in the story of Mr. Roscoe's misfortunes, and one which cannot fail to interest the studious mind, that the parting with his books seemed to have touched upon his tenderest feelings, and to have been the only circumstance that could provoke the notice of his muse. The scholar only knows how dear these silent, yet eloquent, companions of pure thoughts and innocent hours become in the season of adversity, when all that is worldly turns to dross around us, these only retain their steady value, when friends grow cold, and the converse of intimates languishes into vapid civility and commonplace. These only continue the unaltered countenance of happier days, and cheer us with that true friendship which never deceived hope nor deserted sorrow. I do not wish to censure, but surely, if the people of Liverpool had been properly sensible of what was due to Mr. Roscoe and themselves, his library would never have been sold. Good worldly reasons may, doubtless, be given for the circumstance, which it would be difficult to combat with others that might seem merely fanciful. But it certainly appears to me such an opportunity as seldom occurs of cheering a noble mind struggling under misfortunes by one of the most delicate but most expressive tokens of public sympathy. It is difficult, however, to estimate a man of genius properly who is daily before our eyes. He becomes mingled and confounded with other men. 
his great qualities lose their novelty. We become too familiar with the common materials which form the basis even of the loftiest character. Some of Mr. Roscoe's townsmen may regard him merely as a man of business, others as a politician. All find him engaged like themselves in ordinary occupations, and surpassed, perhaps, by themselves in some points of worldly wisdom. Even that amiable and unostentatious simplicity of character, which gives a nameless grace to real elegance, may cause him to be undervalued by some coarse minds, who do not know that true worth is always void of glare and pretension. But the man of letters, who speaks of Liverpool, speaks of it as the residence of Roscoe. The intelligent traveller who visits it inquires where Roscoe is to be seen. He is the literary landmark of the place, indicating its existence to the distant scholar. He is like Pompey's column at Alexandria, towering alone in classic dignity. The following sonnet, addressed by Mr. Roscoe to his books, on parting with them, has already been alluded to. If anything can add effect to the pure feeling and elevated thought here displayed, it is the conviction that the whole is no effusion of fancy, but a faithful transcript from the writer's heart. To my books As one who, destined from his friends to part, regrets his loss, but hopes again or while, to share their converse and enjoy their smile, and tempers as he may afflictions dart. Thus loved associates, chiefs of elder art, teachers of wisdom, who could once beguile my tedious hours, enlighten every toil, I now resign you, nor with fainting heart, for pass a few short years or days or hours, and happier seasons may their dawn unfold, and all your sacred fellowship restore, when, freed from earth, unlimited its powers, mine shall with mine direct communion hold, and kindred spirits meet to part no more. End of chapter 2 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 3 of Washington Irving's Visit to England by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Country Church. A gentleman, what o oh, the wool pack or the sugar chest or lists of velvet, which is it, pound or yard, you vend your gentry by? Beggar's Bush. There are few places more favorable to the study of character than an English country church. I was once passing a few weeks at the seat of a friend, who resided in, the vicinity of one the appearance of which particularly struck my fancy. It was one of those rich morsels of quaint antiquity, which give such a peculiar charm to English landscape. It stood in the midst of a country filled with ancient families, and contained within its cold and silent aisles the congregated dust of many noble generations. The interior walls were encrusted with monuments of every age and style. The light streamed through windows dimmed with armorial bearings, richly emblazoned in stained glass. In various parts of the church were tombs of knights and high-born dames, of gorgeous workmanship, with their effigies in colored marble. On every side the eye was struck with some instance of aspiring mortality, some haughty memorial which human pride had erected over its kindred dust in this temple of the most humble of all religions. The congregation was composed of the neighboring people of rank, who sat in pews sumptuously lined and cushioned, furnished with richly gilded prayer books, and decorated with their arms upon the pew doors of the villagers and peasantry who filled the back seats and a small gallery beside the organ and of the poor of the parish who were ranged on benches in the aisles the service was performed by a snuffling well-fed vicar who had a snug dwelling near the church he was a privileged guest at all the tables of the neighborhood 
and had been the keenest fox hunter in the country until age and good living had disabled him from doing anything more than ride to see the hounds throw off and make one at the hunting dinner under the ministry of such a pastor i found it impossible to get into the train of thought suitable to the time and place so having like many other feeble christians compromised with my conscience by laying the sin of my own delinquency at another person's threshold i occupied myself by making observations on my neighbors i was as yet a stranger in england and curious to notice the manners of its fashionable classes i found as usual that there was the least pretension where there was the most acknowledged title to respect i was particularly struck for instance with the family of a nobleman of high rank consisting of several sons and daughters nothing could be more simple and unassuming than their appearance they generally came to church in the plainest equipage and often on foot the young ladies would stop and converse in the kindest manner with the peasantry caress the children and listen to the stories of the humble cottagers their countenances were open and beautifully fair with an expression of high refinement but at the same time a frank cheerfulness and engaging affability their brothers were tall and elegantly formed they were dressed fashionably but simply with strict neatness and propriety but without any mannerism or foppishness their whole demeanor was easy and natural with that lofty grace and noble frankness which bespeak free-born souls that have never been checked in their growth by feelings of inferiority there is a healthful hardiness about real dignity that never dreads contact and communion with others however humble it is only spurious pride that is morbid and sensitive and shrinks from every touch i was pleased to see the manner in which they would converse with the peasantry about those rural concerns and field sports in which the gentlemen of the country so much delight in these conversations there was neither haughtiness on the one part nor servility on the other and you were only reminded of the difference of rank by the habitual respect of the peasant in contrast to these was the family of a wealthy citizen who had amassed a vast fortune and having purchased the estate and mansion of a ruined nobleman in the neighborhood was endeavoring to assume all the style and dignity of an hereditary lord of the soil the family always came to church and prince they were rolled majestically along in a carriage emblazoned with arms the crest glittered in silver radiance from every part of the harness where a crest could possibly be placed a fat coachman in a three-cornered hat richly laced and a flaxen wig curling close round his rosy face was seated on the box with a sleek danish dog beside him two footmen in gorgeous liveries with huge bouquets and gold-headed canes lolled behind the carriage rose and sunk on its long springs with a peculiar stateliness of motion the very horses champed their bits arched their necks and glanced their eyes more proudly than common horses either because they had caught a little of the family feeling or were reined up more tightly than ordinary i could not but admire the style with which the splendid pageant was brought up to the gate of the churchyard there was a vast effect produced at the turning of an angle of the wall a great smacking of the whip straining and scrambling of the horses glistening of harness and flashing of wheels through gravel this was the moment of triumph and vain glory to the coachman the horses were urged and checked until they were fretted into a foam they threw out their feet in a prancing trot dashing about pebbles at every step the crowd of villagers sauntering quietly to church opened precipitately to the right and left gaping in vacant admiration on reaching the gate the horses were pulled up with a suddenness that produced an immediate stop and almost threw them on their haunches there was an extraordinary hurry of the footmen to alight pull down the steps and prepare everything for the descent on earth of this august family the old citizen first emerged his round red face from out the door looking about him with the pompous air of a man accustomed to rule on change and shake the stock market with a nod his consort 
a fine, fleshly, comfortable dame, followed him. There seemed, I must confess, but little pride in her composition. She was the picture of broad, honest, vulgar enjoyment. The world went well with her, and she liked the world. She had fine clothes, a fine house, a fine carriage, fine children. Everything was fine about her. It was nothing but driving about and visiting and feasting. Life was to her a perpetual revel. It was one long Lord Mayor's day. Two daughters succeeded to this goodly couple. They certainly were handsome, but had a supercilious air that chilled admiration and disposed the spectator to be critical. They were ultra-fashionable in dress, and, though no one could deny the richness of their decorations, yet their appropriateness might be questioned amidst the simplicity of a country church. They descended loftily from the carriage, and moved up the line of peasantry with a step that seemed dainty of the soil it trod on. They cast an excursive glance around, that passed coldly over the burly faces of the peasantry, until they met the eyes of the nobleman's family, when their countenances immediately brightened into smiles, and they made the most profound and elegant courtesies, which were returned in a manner that showed they were but slight acquaintances. I must not forget the two sons of this inspiring citizen, who came to church in a dashing curricle with outriders. They were arrayed in the extremity of the mode, with all that pedantry of dress which marks the man of questionable pretensions to style. They kept entirely by themselves, eyeing every one askance that came near them, as if measuring his claims to respectability. Yet they were without conversation, except the exchange of an occasional cant phrase. They even moved artificially, for their bodies, in compliance with the caprice of the day, had been disciplined into the absence of all ease and freedom. Art had done everything to accomplish them as men of fashion, but nature had denied them the nameless grace. They were vulgarly shaped, like men formed for the common purposes of life, and had that air of supercilious assumption, which is never seen in the true gentleman. I have been rather minute in drawing the pictures of these two families, because I considered them specimens of what is often to be met with in this country, the unpretending great and the arrogant little. I have no respect for titled rank, unless it be accompanied with true nobility of soul. But I have remarked, in all countries where artificial distinctions exist, that the very highest classes are always the most courteous and unassuming. Those who are well assured of their own standing are least apt to trespass on that of others. Whereas, nothing is so offensive as the aspirings of vulgarity, which thinks to elevate itself by humiliating its neighbor. As I have brought these families into contrast, I must notice their behavior in church. That of the nobleman's family was quiet, serious, and attentive. Not that they appeared to have any fervor of devotion, but rather a respect for sacred things and sacred places, inseparable from good breeding. The others, on the contrary, were in a perpetual flutter and whisper. They betrayed a continual consciousness of finery, and the sorry ambition of being the wonders of a rural congregation. The old gentleman was the only one really attentive to the service. He took the whole burden of family devotion upon himself, standing bolt upright, and uttering the responses with a loud voice that might be heard all over the church. It was evident that he was one of those thorough church and king men, who connect the idea of devotion and loyalty, who consider the deity, somehow or other, of the government party, and religion, a very excellent sort of thing, that ought to be countenanced and kept up. When he joined so loudly in the service, it seemed more by way of example to the lower orders, to show them that, though so great and wealthy, he was not above being religious, as I have seen a turtle-fed alderman swallow publicly a basin of charity soup, smacking his lips to every mouthful, and pronouncing it excellent food for the poor. When the service was at an end, I was curious to witness the several exits of my groups. The young noblemen and their sisters, as the day was fine, preferred strolling home across the fields, chatting with the country people as they went. The others departed as they came, in grand parade. Again were the equipages wheeled up to the gate. 
There was again the smacking of the whips, the clattering of hoofs, and the glittering of harness. The horses started off almost at a bound. The villagers again hurried to right and left. The wheels threw up a cloud of dust, and the Aspirin family was wrapped out of sight in a whirlwind. End of Chapter 3 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 4 of Washington Irving's Visit to England by Washington Irving This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano the Mutability of Literature A Colloquy in Westminster Abbey I know that all beneath the moon decays, And what by mortals in this world is brought, In time's great periods shall return to naught. I know that all the muses heavenly rays, With toil of sprite which are so dearly bought, As idle sounds, a few or none are sought that there is nothing lighter than mere praise drummond of hawthornden there are certain half-dreaming moods of mind in which we naturally steal away from noise and glare and seek some quiet haunt where we may indulge our reveries and build our air castles undisturbed in such a mood I was loitering about the old grey cloisters of Westminster Abbey, enjoying that luxury of wandering thought, which one is apt to dignify with the name of reflection, when suddenly an eruption of madcap boys from Westminster School, playing at football, broke in upon the monastic stillness of the place, making the vaulted passages and mouldering tombs echo with their merriment. I sought to take refuge from their noise by penetrating still deeper into the solitudes of the pile, and applied to one of the vergers for admission to the library. He conducted me through a portal rich with the crumbling sculpture of former ages, which opened upon a gloomy passage leading to the chapter house, and the chamber in which the doomsday book is deposited. Just within the passage is a small door on the left. To this the verger applied a key. It was double-locked, and opened with some difficulty, as if seldom used. We now ascended a dark, narrow staircase, and, passing through a second floor, entered the library. I found myself in a lofty antique hall, the roof supported by massive joists of old English oak. It was soberly lighted by a row of Gothic windows, at a considerable height from the floor and which apparently opened upon the roofs of the cloisters. An ancient picture of some reverend dignitary of the church, in his robes, hung over the fireplace. Around the hall, and in a small gallery, were the books, arranged in carved oaken cases. They consisted principally of old polemical writers, and were much more worn by time than use. In the center of the library was a solitary table, with two or three books on it, an inkstand without ink, and a few pens parched by long disuse. The place seemed fitted for quiet study and profound meditation. It was buried deep among the massive walls of the abbey, and shut up from the tumult of the world. I could only hear now and then the shouts of the schoolboys faintly swelling from the cloisters, and the sound of a bell tolling for prayers echoing soberly along the roofs of the abbey. By degrees, the shouts of merriment grew fainter and fainter, and at length died away. The bell ceased to toll, and a profound silence reigned through the dusky hall. I had taken down a little thick quarto, curiously bound in parchment with brass clasps, and seated myself at the table in a venerable elbow chair. Instead of reading, however, I was beguiled by the solemn monastic air and lifeless quiet of the place into a train of musing. As I looked around upon the old volumes in their mouldering covers, thus ranged on the shelves and apparently never disturbed in their repose, 
I could not but consider the library a kind of literary catacomb, where authors, like mummies, are piously entombed, and left to blacken and moulder in dusty oblivion. How much, thought I, has each of these volumes, now thrust aside with such indifference, cost some aching head? How many weary days? How many sleepless nights? How have their authors buried themselves in the solitude of cells and cloisters, shut themselves up from the face of man, and the still more blessed face of nature, and devoted themselves to painful research and intense reflection, and all for what? To occupy an inch of dusty shelf? To have the titles of their works read now and then in a future age by some drowsy churchman, or casual straggler like myself? and in another age to be lost even to remembrance. Such is the amount of this boasted immortality, a mere temporary rumor, a local sound, like the tone of that bell which is tolled among these towers, filling the ear for a moment, lingering transiently in echo, and then passing away like a thing that was not. While I sat half murmuring, half meditating, these unprofitable speculations with my head resting on my hand. I was thrumming with the other hand upon the quarto, until I accidentally loosened the clasps, when, to my utter astonishment, the little book gave two or three yawns, like one awaking from a deep sleep, then a husky hem, and at length began to talk. At first its voice was very hoarse and broken, being much troubled by a cobweb which some studious spider had woven across it, and having probably contracted a cold from long exposure to the chills and damps of the abbey. In a short time, however, it became more distinct, and I soon found it an exceedingly fluent, conversable little tome. Its language, to be sure, was rather quaint and obsolete, and its pronunciation what, in the present day, would be deemed barbarous but I shall endeavor, as far as I am able, to render it in modern parlance. It began with railings about the neglect of the world, about merit being suffered to languish in obscurity, and other such commonplace topics of literary repining, and complained bitterly that it had not been opened for more than two centuries, that the dean only looked now and then into the library, sometimes took down a volume or two, trifled with them for a few moments, and then returned them to their shelves. "'What a plague do they mean?' said the little quarto, which I began to perceive was somewhat choleric. "'What a plague do they mean by keeping several thousand volumes of us, shut up here, and watched by a set of old vergers, like so many beauties in a harem, merely to be looked at now and then by the dean? Books were written to give pleasure and to be enjoyed.' and I would have a rule passed, that the dean should pay each of us a visit at least once a year. Or, if he is not equal to the task, let them once in a while turn loose the whole school of Westminster among us, that at any rate we may now and then have an airing. Softly, my worthy friend, replied I, you are not aware how much better you are off than most books of your generation. By being stored away in this ancient library, you are like the treasured remains of those saints and monarchs which lie enshrined in the adjoining chapels, while the remains of their contemporary mortals, left to the ordinary course of nature, have long since returned to dust. Uh, sir, said the little tome, ruffling his leaves and looking big, I was written for all the world, not for the bookworms of an abbey. I was intended to circulate from hand to hand, like other great contemporary works. But here have I been clasped up for more than two centuries, and might have silently fallen a prey to these worms that are playing the very vengeance with my intestines, if you had not by chance given me an opportunity of uttering a few last words before I go to pieces. My good friend, rejoined I, had you been left to the circulation of which you speak, you would long ere this have been no more. To judge from your physiognomy, you are now well stricken in years. Very few of your contemporaries can be at present in existence, and those few owe their longevity to being immured, like yourself, in old libraries, which, suffer me to add, instead of likening to harems, 
you might more properly and gratefully have compared to those infirmaries attached to religious establishments for the benefit of the old and decrepit, and where, by quiet fostering and no employment, they often endure to an amazingly good-for-nothing old age. You talk of your contemporaries as if in circulation. Where do we meet with their works? What do we hear of Robert Groteste, of Lincoln? No one could have told harder than he for immortality. He is said to have written nearly two hundred volumes. He built, as it were, a pyramid of books to perpetuate his name. But alas, the pyramid has long since fallen, and only a few fragments are scattered in various libraries, where they are scarcely disturbed, even by the antiquarian. What do we hear of Geraldus Cambrensis, the historian, antiquary, philosopher, theologian, and poet? He declined two bishoprics, that he might shut himself up and write for posterity. But posterity never inquires after his labors. What of Henry of Huntington, who besides a learned history of England, wrote a treatise on the contempt of the world, which the world has revenged by forgetting him? What is quoted of Joseph of Exeter, styled the miracle of his age in classical composition, of his three great heroic poems, one is lost forever, excepting a mere fragment, the others are known only to a few of the curious in literature, and as to his love verses and epigrams, they have entirely disappeared. What is in current use of John Wallace the Franciscan, who acquired the name of the Tree of Life, of William of Malmesbury, of Simeon of Durham, of Benedict of Peterborough, of John Hanville of St. Albans, of Prithee, friend, cried the quarto in a testy tone, how old do you think me? You are talking of authors that lived long before my time, and wrote either in Latin or French, so that they, in a manner, expatriated themselves, and deserved to be forgotten. Footnote. In Latin and French hath many serene wits had great delight to end it, and have many noble things fulfilled. But certes there been some that speaketh their polys in French, of which speech the Frenchmen have as good a fantasy as we have in hearing of Frenchmen's English. Chaucer's Testament of Love End of footnote But I, sir, was ushered into the world, from the press of the renowned Winkin de Word. I was written in my own native tongue, at a time when the language had become fixed, and indeed I was considered a model of pure and elegant English. I should observe that these remarks were couched in such intolerably antiquated terms that I have had infinite difficulty in rendering them into modern phraseology. I cry you mercy, said I, for mistaking your age, but it matters little. Almost all the writers of your time have likewise passed into forgetfulness, and de Word's publications are mere literary rarities among book collectors. The purity and stability of language, too, of which you found your claims to perpetuity, have been the fallacious dependence of authors of every age, even back to the times of the worthy Robert of Gloucester, who wrote his history and rhymes of mongrel Saxon. Footnote. Holinshed, in his chronicle, observes, afterwards also, by diligent veil with Geoffrey Chaucer and John Gower, in the time of Richard the Second, and after them of John Scoggin, and John Ludgate, monk of Berry, Our said tongue was brought to an excellent pass, notwithstanding that it never came unto the type of perfection until the time of Queen Elizabeth, wherein John Jewell, Bishop of Sarum, John Fox, and sundry learned and excellent writers, have fully accomplished the ornamenture of the same to the great praise and mortal commendation. End of footnote. Even now many talk of Spencer's well of pure English undefiled, as if the language ever sprang from a well or fountainhead, and was not rather a mere confluence of various tongues, perpetually subject to changes and intermixtures. It is this which has made English literature so extremely mutable, and the reputation built upon it so fleeting, unless thought can be committed to something more permanent and unchangeable than such a medium. Even thought must share the fate of everything else, and fall into decay. 
they should serve as a check upon the vanity and exultation of the most popular writer. He finds the language in which he has embarked his fame gradually altering and subject to the dilapidations of time and the caprice of fashion. He looks back and beholds the early authors of his country, once the favorites of their day, supplanted by modern writers. A few short ages have covered them with obscurity, and their merits can only be relished by the quaint taste of the bookworm. And such, he anticipates, will be the fate of his own work, which, however it may be admired in its day, and held up as a model of purity, will in the course of years grow antiquated and obsolete, until it shall become almost as unintelligible in its native land as an Egyptian obelisk, or one of those runic inscriptions said to exist in the deserts of Tartary. I declare, added I, with some emotion, when I contemplate a modern library, filled with new works and all the bravery of rich gilding and binding, I feel disposed to sit down and weep, like the good Xerxes, when he surveyed his army, pranked out in all the splendor of military array, and reflected that in one hundred years not one of them would be in existence. Ah, said the little quarto with a heavy sigh, I see how it is. These and modern scribblers have superseded all the good old authors. I suppose nothing is read nowadays but Sir Philip Sidney's Arcadia, Sackville's stately plays, and mirror for magistrates, or the fine-spun euphemisms of the unparalleled John Lyle. Well, there you are again mistaken, said I. The writers whom you suppose in vogue, because they happened to be so when you were last in circulation, have long since had their day. Sir Philip Sidney's Arcadia, the immortality of which was so fondly predicted by his admirers. Footnote. Live ever sweet book, the simple image of his gentle wit, and the golden pillar of his noble courage, and ever notify unto the world that thy writer was the secretary of eloquence, the breath of the muses, the honey-bee of the daintiest flowers of wit and art, the pith of morale and intellectual virtues, the arm of Bologna in the field, the tongue of Sueda in the chamber, the spirits of practice and s, and the paragon of excellence in print. Harvey Pierce's Super Erogation End of footnote And which, in truth, was full of noble thoughts, delicate images, and graceful turns of language, is now scarcely ever mentioned. Sackville has strutted into obscurity, and even Lyle, though his writings were once the delight of a court, and apparently perpetuated by a proverb, is now scarcely known even by name. A whole crowd of authors who wrote and wrangled at the time have likewise gone down with all their writings and their controversies. Wave after wave of succeeding literature has rolled over them, until they are buried so deep that it is only now and then that some industrious diver after fragments of antiquity brings up a specimen for the gratification of the curious. For my part, I continued, I consider this mutability of language a wise precaution of providence for the benefit of the world at large, and of authors in particular. To reason from analogy, we daily behold the varied and beautiful tribes of vegetables springing up, flourishing, adorning the fields for a short time, then fading into dust, to make way for their successors. Were not this the case, the fecundity of nature would be a grievance instead of a blessing. The earth would groan with rank and excessive vegetation, and its surface become a tangled wilderness. In like manner, the works of genius and learning decline and make way for subsequent productions. Language gradually varies, and with it fade away the writings of authors, who have flourished their allotted time. Otherwise the creative powers of genius would overstock the world, and the mind would be completely bewildered in the endless mazes of literature. Formerly there were some restraints on the success of multiplication. Works had to be transcribed by hand, which was a slow and laborious operation. They were written either on parchment, which was expensive, so that one work was often erased to make way for another, or on papyrus, which was fragile 
and extremely perishable. Authorship was a limited and unprofitable craft, pursued chiefly by monks in the leisure and solitude of their cloisters. The accumulation of manuscripts was slow and costly, and confined almost entirely to monasteries. To these circumstances it may, in some measure, be owing that we have not been inundated by the intellect of antiquity, that the fountains of thought have not been broken up and modern genius drowned in the deluge. But the inventions of paper and the press have put an end to all these restraints. They have made every one a writer, and enabled every mind to pour itself into print, and diffuse itself over the whole intellectual world. The consequences are alarming. The stream of literature has swollen into a torrent, augmented into a river, expanded into a sea. A few centuries since, five or six hundred manuscripts constituted a great library. But what would you say to libraries, such as actually exist, containing three or four hundred thousand volumes, legions of authors at the same time busy, and the press going on with fearfully increasing activity, to double and quadruple the number? unless some unforeseen mortality should break out among the progeny of the muse, now that she has become so prolific, I tremble for posterity. I fear the mere fluctuation of language will not be sufficient. Criticism may do much. It increases with the increase of literature, and resembles one of those salutary checks on population spoken of by economists. All possible encouragement, therefore, should be given to the growth of critics, good or bad. But I fear all will be in vain. Let criticism do what it may. Writers will write, printers will print, and the world will inevitably be overstocked with good books. It will soon be the employment of a lifetime merely to learn their names. Many a man of passable information at the present day reads scarcely anything but reviews, and before long, a man of erudition will be little better than a mere walking catalogue. My very good sir, said the little quarto, yawning most drearily in my face, excuse my interrupting you, but I perceive you are rather given to prose. I would ask the fate of an author who was making some noise just as I left the world. His reputation, however, was considered quite temporary. The learned shook their heads at him, for he was a poor, half-educated varlet, that knew little of Latin, and nothing of Greek, and had been obliged to run the country for deer-stealing. I think his name was Shakespeare. I presume he soon sunk into oblivion. Oh, on the contrary, said I, it is owing to that very man that the literature of his period has experienced a duration beyond the ordinary term of English literature. There rise authors now and then, who seem proof against the mutability of language, because they have rooted themselves in the unchanging principles of human nature. They are like gigantic trees that we sometimes see on the banks of a stream, which by their vast and deep roots, penetrating through the mere surface and laying hold on the very foundations of the earth, preserve the soil around them from being swept away by the ever-flowing current, and hold up many a neighboring plant, and perhaps worthless weed, to perpetuity. Such is the case with Shakespeare, whom we behold defying the encroachments of time, retaining in modern use the language and literature of his day, and giving duration to many an indifferent author, merely from having flourished in his vicinity. But even he, I grieve to say, is gradually assuming the tint of age, and his whole form is overrun by a profusion of commentators, who, like clambering vines and creepers, almost bury the noble plant that upholds them. Here the little quarto began to heave his sides and chuckle, until at length he broke out into a plethoric fit of laughter that had well nigh choked him by the reason of his excessive corpulency. Mighty well, cried he, as soon as he could recover breath, mighty well. And so you would persuade me that the literature of an age is to be perpetuated by a vagabond deer-stealer, by a man without learning, by a poet, forsooth a poet and here he wheezed forth another fit of laughter. I confess that I felt somewhat nettled at this rudeness, which, however, I pardoned on account of his having flourished in a less polished age. I determined, nevertheless, not to give up my point. 
Yes, resumed I positively, a poet, for of all writers he has the best chance for immortality. Others may write from the head, but he writes from the heart, and the heart will always understand him. He is the faithful portrayer of nature, whose features are always the same, and always interesting. Prose writers are voluminous and unwieldy, their pages crowded with commonplaces, and their thoughts expanded into tediousness. But with the true poet, everything is terse, touching, or brilliant. He gives the choicest thoughts in the choicest language. He illustrates them by everything that he sees most striking in nature and art. He enriches them by pictures of human life, such as it is passing before him. His writings, therefore, contain the spirit, the aroma, if I may use the phrase, of the age in which he lives. They are caskets which enclose within a small compass the wealth of the language, its family jewels, which are thus transmitted in a portable form to posterity. The setting may occasionally be antiquated, and require now and then to be renewed, as in the case of Chaucer, but the brilliancy and intrinsic value of the gems continue unaltered. Cast a look back over the long reach of literary history, what vast valleys of dullness, filled with monkish legends and academical controversies, what bogs of theological speculations, what dreary wastes of metaphysics. Here and there only do we behold the heaven-illumined bards, elevated like beacons on their widely separated heights, to transmit the pure light of poetical intelligence from age to age. Footnote. Through earth and waters deep, the pen by skill doth pass, and featly naps the world's abuse, and shews us in a glass. The virtue and the vice, of every wit alive, the honeycomb that bee doth make, is not so sweet and hive, as are the golden leaves that drops from poet's head, which doth surmount our common talk, as far as droth doth lead. Churchyard. End of footnote. I was just about to launch forth into eulogiums upon the poets of the day, when the sudden opening of the door caused me to turn my head. It was the verger who came to inform me that it was time to close the library. I sought to have a parting word with the quarto, but the worthy little tone was silent, the clasps were closed, and it looked perfectly unconscious of all that had passed. I have been to the library two or three times since, and have endeavored to draw it into further conversation, but in vain, and whether all this rambling colloquy actually took place, or whether it was another of those old daydreams to which I am subject, I have never, to this moment, been able to discover. End of chapter four. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter five of Washington Irving's Visit to England by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano Rural Funerals Here's a few flowers, but about midnight more, the herbs that have oil them cold duo the night, our strewings fittest for graves. You were as flowers now withered, even so, these herblets shall which we upon you strow. Cymbeline Among the beautiful and simple-hearted customs of rural life which still linger in some parts of England are those of strewing flowers before the funerals and planting them at the graves of departed friends. These, it is said, are the remains of some of the rites of the primitive church, but they are of still higher antiquity having been observed among the Greeks and Romans, and frequently mentioned by their writers, and were no doubt the spontaneous tributes of unlettered affection, originating long before art had tasked itself to modulate sorrow into song, or story it on the monument. They are now only to be met within the most distant and retired places of the kingdom, 
where fashion and innovation have not been able to throng in and trample out all the curious and interesting traces of the olden time in glamorganshire we are told the bed whereon the corpse lies is covered with flowers a custom alluded to in one of the wild and plaintive ditties of ophelia white his shroud as the mountain snow larded all with sweet flowers which be wept to the grave did go with true love showers there is also a most delicate and beautiful rite observed in some of the remote villages of the south at the funeral of a female who has died young and unmarried a chaplet of white flowers is borne before the corpse by a young girl nearest in age size and resemblance and is afterwards hung up in the church over the accustomed seat of the deceased these chaplets are sometimes made of white paper in imitation of flowers and inside of them is generally a pair of white gloves they are intended as emblems of the purity of the deceased and the crown of glory which she has received in heaven in some parts of the country also the dead are carried to the grave with the singing of psalms and hymns a kind of triumph to show says bourne that they have finished their course with joy and are become conquerors this i am informed is observed in some of the northern counties particularly in northumberland and it has a pleasing though melancholy effect to hear of a still evening in some lonely country scene the mournful melody of a funeral dirge swelling from a distance and to see the train slowly moving along the landscape thus thus and thus we compass round thy harmless and unhaunted ground and as we sing thy dirge we will the daffodil and other flowers lay upon the altar of our love thy stone herrick there is also a solemn respect paid by the traveller to the passing funeral in these sequestered places for such spectacles occurring among the quiet abodes of nature sink deep into the soul as the morning train approaches he pauses uncovered to let it go by he then follows silently in the rear sometimes quite to the grave at other times for a few hundred yards and having paid this tribute of respect to the deceased turns and resumes his journey the rich vein of melancholy which runs through the english character and gives it some of its most touching and ennobling graces is finely evidenced in these pathetic customs and in the solicitude shown by the common people for an honored and a peaceful grave the humblest peasant whatever may be his lowly lot while living is anxious that some little respect may be paid to his remains sir thomas overbury describing the fair and happy milkmaid observes thus lives she and all her care is that she may die in the springtime to have store of flowers stuck upon her winding sheet the poets too who always breathe the feeling of a nation continually avert to this fond solicitude about the grave in the maid's tragedy by beaumont and fletcher there is a beautiful instance of the kind describing the capricious melancholy of a broken-hearted girl when she sees a bank stuck full of flowers she with a sigh will tell her servants what a pretty place it were to bury lovers in and made her maids pluck em and strew her over like a corse the custom of decorating graves was once universally prevalent osiers were carefully bent over them to keep the turf uninjured and about them were planted evergreens and flowers we adorn their graves says evelyn in his silva with flowers and redolent plants just emblems of the life of man which has been compared in holy scriptures to those fading beauties whose roots being buried in dishonour rise again in glory 
This usage has now become extremely rare in England, but it may still be met within the churchyards of retired villages among the Welsh mountains, and I recollect an instance of it at the small town of Rutfin, which lies at the head of the beautiful Vale of Clude. I have been told also by a friend, who was present at the funeral of a young girl in Glamorganshire, that the female attendants had their aprons full of flowers, which, as soon as the body was interred, they stuck about the grave. He noticed several graves, which had been decorated in the same manner. As the flowers had been merely stuck in the ground, and not planted, they had soon withered, and might be seen in various states of decay, some drooping, others quite perished. They were afterwards to be supplanted by holly, rosemary, and other evergreens, which on some graves had grown to great luxuriance, and overshadowed the tombstones. There was formerly a melancholy fancifulness in the arrangement of these rustic offerings that had something in it truly poetical. The rose was sometimes blended with the lily to form a general emblem of frail mortality. This sweet flower, said Evelyn, born on a branch set with thorns and accompanied with the lily, are natural hieroglyphics of our fugitive, umbertile, anxious, and transitory life, which, making so fair a show for a time, is not yet without its thorns and crosses. The nature and color of the flowers, and of the ribbons with which they were tied, had often a particular reference to the qualities or story of the deceased, or were expressive of the feelings of the mourner. In an old poem, entitled Corydon's Doleful Knell, a lover specifies the decorations he intends to use. A garland shall be framed by art and nature's skill of sundry colored flowers in token of good will and sundry colored ribbons on it i will bestow but chiefly black and yellow with her to grave shall go i'll deck her tomb with flowers the rarest ever seen and with my tears as showers i'll keep them fresh and green the white rose we are told was planted at the grave of a virgin her chaplet was tied with white ribbons in token of her spotless innocence though sometimes black ribbons were intermingled to bespeak the grief of the survivors the red rose was occasionally used in remembrance of such as had been remarkable for benevolence but roses in general were appropriated to the graves of lovers evelyn tells us that the custom was not altogether extinct in his time near his dwelling in the county of surrey where the maidens yearly planted and decked the graves of their defunct sweethearts with rose bushes and camden likewise remarks in his britannia here is also a certain custom observed time out of mind of planting rose trees upon the graves especially by the young men and maids who have lost their loves so that this churchyard is now full of them when the deceased had been unhappy in their loves emblems of a more gloomy character were used such as the hue and cypress and if flowers were strewn they were of the most melancholy colors thus in poems by thomas stanley esq published in sixteen fifty one is the following stanza yet strew upon my dismal grave such offerings as you have forsaken cypress and you for kinder flowers can take no birth or growth from such unhappy earth in the maid's tragedy a pathetic little air is introduced illustrative of this mode of decorating the funerals of females who had been disappointed in love lay a garland on my hearse of the dismal hue maidens willow branches wear say i died true my love was false but i was firm from my hour of birth upon my buried body lie lightly gentle earth the natural effect of sorrow over the dead is to refine and elevate the mind and we have a proof of it in the purity of sentiment and the unaffected elegance of thought 
which pervaded the whole of these funeral observances. Thus it was an especial precaution that none but sweet-scented evergreens and flowers should be employed. The intention seems to have been to soften the horrors of the tomb, to beguile the mind from brooding over the disgraces of perishing mortality, and to associate the memory of the deceased with the most delicate and beautiful objects in nature. There is a dismal process going on in the grave, ere dust can return to its kindred dust, which the imagination shrinks from contemplating. And we seek still to think of the form we have loved, with those refined associations, which it awakened when blooming before us in youth and beauty. Lay her in the earth, says Laertes, of his virgin sister, and from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violets spring. Herrick, also, in his dirge of Jephtha, pours forth a fragrant flow of poetical thought and image, which in a manner embalms the dead in the recollections of the living. Sleep in thy peace, thy bed of spice, and make this place all paradise. May sweets grow here, and smoke from hence, fat frankincense. Let balm and cassia send their scent from out thy maiden monument. May all she maids at wanted hours come forth to strew thy tomb with flowers. May virgins, when they come to mourn, male incense burn upon thy altar then return and leave thee sleeping in thy urn i might crowd my pages with extracts from the older british poets who wrote when these rites were more prevalent and delighted frequently to allude to them but i have already quoted more than is necessary i cannot however refrain from giving a passage from shakespeare even though it should appear trite, which illustrates the emblematical meaning often conveyed in these floral tributes, and at the same time possesses that magic of language and apostatus of imagery for which he stands preeminent. With fairest flowers, whilst summer lasts, and I live here, Fidel, I'll sweeten thy sad grave, thou shalt not lack the flower that's like thy face pale primrose nor the azured harebell like thy veins no nor the leaf of englantine whom not to slander outsweetened not thy breath there is certainly something more affecting in these prompt and spontaneous offerings of nature than in the most costly monuments of art the hand strews the flower while the heart is warm and the tear falls on the grave as affection is binding the osier round the sod. But pathos expires under the slow labor of the chisel, and is chilled among the cold conceits of sculptured marble. It is greatly to be regretted that a custom so truly elegant and touching has disappeared from general use, and exists only in the most remote and insignificant villages. But it seems as if poetical custom always shuns the walks of cultivated society in proportion as people grow polite they cease to be poetical they talk of poetry but they have learnt to check its free impulses to distrust its sallying emotions and to supply its most affecting and picturesque usages by studied form and pompous ceremonial few pageants can be more stately and frigid than an english funeral in town it is made up of show and gloomy parade mourning carriages mourning horses mourning plumes and hireling mourners who make a mockery of grief there is a grave digged says jeremy taylor in a solemn morning and a great talk in the neighborhood and when the days are finished they shall be and they shall be remembered no more the associate in the gay and crowded city is soon forgotten the hurrying succession of new intimates and new pleasures, he faces him from our minds, and the very scenes and circles in which he moved are incessantly fluctuating. But funerals in the country are solemnly impressive. The stroke of death makes a wider space in the village circle, and is an awful event in the tranquil uniformity 
of rural life. The passing bell tolls its knell in every ear. It steals with its pervading melancholy over hill and vale, and saddens all the landscape. The fixed and unchanging features of the country also perpetuate the memory of the friend with whom we once enjoyed them, who was the companion of our most retired walks, and gave animation to every lonely scene. His idea is associated with every charm of nature. We hear his voice in the echo which he once delighted to awaken. His spirit haunts the grove which he once frequented it. We think of him in the wild upland solitude, or amidst the pensive beauty of the valley. In the freshness of joyous morning, we remember his beaming smiles and bounding gaiety. And when sober evening returns, with its gathering shadows and subduing quiet, we call to mind many a twilight hour of gentle talk and sweet-souled melancholy. Each lonely place shall him restore, for him the tear be duly shed, beloved till life can charm no more, and mourned till pity's self be dead. Another cause that perpetuates the memory of the deceased in the country is that the grave is more immediately in sight of the survivors. They pass it on their way to prayer. It meets their eyes when their hearts are softened by the exercises of devotion. They linger about it on the Sabbath, when the mind is disengaged from worldly cares, and most disposed to turn aside from present pleasures and present loves and to sit down among the solemn mementos of the past. In North Wales, the peasantry kneel and pray over the graves of their deceased friends for several Sundays after the interment, and where the tender rite of strewing and planting flowers is still practiced. It is always renewed on Easter, Whitsuntide, and other festivals, when the season brings the companion of former festivity more vividly to mind. It is also invariably performed by the nearest relatives and friends. No menials nor hirelings are employed, and if a neighbor yields assistance, it would be deemed an insult to offer compensation. I have dealt upon this beautiful rural custom, because, as it is one of the last, so it is one of the holiest offices of love. The grave is the ordeal of true affection. It is there that the divine passion of the soul manifests its superiority to the instinctive impulse of mere animal attachment. The latter must be continually refreshed and kept alive by the presence of its object. But the love that is seated in the soul can live on long remembrance. The mere inclinations of sense languish and decline with the charms which excited them, and turn with shuddering disgust from the dismal precincts of the tomb. But it is thence that truly spiritual affection rises, purified from every sensual desire, and returns, like a holy flame, to illumine and sanctify the heart of the survivor. The sorrow for the dead is the only sorrow from which we refuse to be divorced. Every other wound we seek to heal, every other affliction to forget. But this wound we consider it a duty to keep open, this affliction we cherish and brood over in solitude. Where is the mother who would willingly forget the infant that perished like a blossom from her arms, though every recollection is a pang? Where is the child that would willingly forget the most tender of parents, though to remember be but to lament? who, even in the hour of agony, would forget the friend over whom he mourns, who, even when the tomb is closing upon the remains of her most loved, when he feels his heart, as it were, crushed in the closing of its portal, would accept of consolation that must be bought by forgetfulness. No, the love which survives the tomb is one of the noblest attributes of the soul. If it has its woes, it has likewise its delights, and when the overwhelming burst of grief is calmed into the gentle tear of recollection, when the sudden anguish and the convulsive agony over the present ruins of all that we most loved is softened away into pensive meditation on all that it was in the days of its loveliness, 
who would root out such a sorrow from the heart though it may sometimes throw a passing cloud over the bright hour of gaiety or spread a deeper sadness over the hour of gloom yet who would exchange it even for the song of pleasure or the burst of revelry no there is a voice from the tomb sweeter than song there is a remembrance of the dead to which we turn even from the charms of the living oh the grave the grave it buries every error covers every defect extinguishes every resentment from its peaceful bosom spring none but fond regrets and tender recollections who can look down upon the grave even of an enemy and not feel a compunctuous throb they should ever have warred with the poor handful of earth that lies mouldering before him but the grave of those we loved what a place for meditation there it is that we call up in long review the whole history of virtue and gentleness and the thousand endearments lavished upon us almost unheeded in the daily intercourse of intimacy there it is that we dwell upon the tenderness the solemn awful tenderness of the parting scene the bed of death with all its stifled griefs its noiseless attendants its mute watchful assiduities the last testimonies of expiring love the feeble fluttering thrilling oh how thrilling pressure of the hand the faint faltering accents struggling in death to give one more assurance of affection the last fond look of the glazing eye turning upon us even from the threshold of existence i go to the grave of buried love and meditate there settle the account with thy conscience for every past benefit unrequited every past endearment unregarded of that departed being who can never 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 return to be soothed by thy contrition if thou art a child and hast ever added a sorrow to the soul or a furrow to the silver brow of an affectionate parent if thou art a husband and hast ever caused the fond bosom that ventured its whole happiness in thy arms to doubt one moment of thy kindness or thy truth if thou art a friend and hast ever wronged in thought or word or deed the spirit that generously confided in thee if thou art a lover and hast ever given one unmerited pang to that true heart which now lies cold and still beneath thy feet then be sure that every unkind look every ungracious word every ungentle action will come thronging back upon thy memory and knocking dolefully at thy soul then be sure that thou wilt lie down sorrowing and repentant on the grave and utter the unheard groan and pour the unavailing tear more deep more bitter because unheard and unavailing then weave thy chaplet of flowers and strew the beauties of nature about the grave console thy broken spirit if thou canst with these tender yet futile tributes of regret but take warning by the bitterness of this thy contrite affliction over the dead and henceforth be more faithful and affectionate in the discharge of thy duties to the living in writing the preceding article it was not intended to give a full detail of the funeral customs of the english peasantry but merely to furnish a few hints and quotations illustrative of particular rites to be appended by way of note to another paper which has been withheld the article swelled insensibly into its present form this is mentioned as an apology for so brief and casual a notice of these usages after they have been amply and learnedly investigated in other works i must observe also that i am well aware that this custom of adorning graves with flowers prevails in other countries besides england indeed in some it is much more general and is observed even by the rich and fashionable but it is then apt to lose its simplicity and to degenerate into affectation bright in his travels in lower hungary tells of monuments of marble and recesses formed for retirement with seats placed among bowers of greenhouse plants 
and that the graves generally are covered with the gayest flowers of the season, he gives a casual picture of filial piety, which I cannot but transcribe, for I trust it is as useful as it is delightful to illustrate the amiable virtues of the sex. When I was at Berlin, says he, I followed the celebrated Iflin to the grave. Mingled with some pomp you might trace much real feeling. In the midst of the ceremony my attention was attracted by a young woman, who stood on a mound of earth, newly covered with turf, which she anxiously protected from the feet of the passing crowd. It was the tomb of her parent, and the figure of this affectionate daughter presented a monument more striking than the most costly work of art. I will barely add an instance of sepulchral decoration that I once met with among the mountains of Switzerland. It was at the village of Gersau, which stands on the borders of the lake of Lucerne, at the foot of Mount Rigi. It was once the capital of a miniature republic, shut up between the Alps and the lake, and accessible on the land side only by footpaths. The whole force of the republic did not exceed six hundred fighting men, and a few miles of circumference, scooped out, as it were, from the bosom of the mountains, comprised its territory. The village of Gersau seemed separated from the rest of the world, and retained the golden simplicity of a purer age. It had a small church, with a burying ground adjoining. At the heads of the graves were placed crosses of wood or iron. On some were affixed miniatures, rudely executed, but evidently attempts at likenesses of the deceased. On the crosses were hung chaplets of flowers, some withering, others fresh, as if occasionally renewed. I paused with interest at this scene. I felt that I was at the source of poetical description. From these were the beautiful but unaffected offerings of the heart, which poets are fain to record. In a gayer and more populous place, I should have suspected them to have been suggested by factitious sentiment derived from books. But the good people of Gersal knew little of books. There was not a novel nor a love poem in the village, and I question whether any peasant of the place dreamt, while he was twining a fresh chaplet for the grave of his mistress, that he was fulfilling one of the most fanciful rites of poetical devotion, and that he was practically a poet. End of chapter 5 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 6 of Washington Irving's Visit to England by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Stratford on Avon. Thou soft flowing Avon, by thy silver stream of things more than mortal sweet Shakespeare would dream. The fairies by moonlight dance round his green bed, for hallowed the turf is, which pillowed his head. Garrick To a homeless man, who has no spot on this wide world, which he can truly call his own, there is a momentary feeling of something like independence, and territorial consequence, when, after a weary day's travel, he kicks off his boots, thrusts his feet into slippers, and stretches himself before an inn fire. Let the world without go as it may, let kingdoms rise or fall, so long as he has the wherewithal to pay his bill, he is, for the time being, the very monarch of all he surveys. The armchair is his throne, the poker his scepter. In the little parlor, some twelve feet square, his undisputed empire. It is a morsel of certainly snatched from the midst of the uncertainties of life. It is a sunny moment gleaming out kindly on a cloudy day. And he who has advanced some way on the pilgrimage of existence knows the importance of husbanding even morsels in moments of enjoyment. 
Shall I not take mine ease in mine inn, thought I, as I gave the fire a stir, lolled back in my elbow chair, and cast a complacent look about the little parlour of the red horse at Stratford-on-Avon. The words of sweet Shakespeare were just passing through my mind, as the clock struck midnight from the tower of the church in which he lies buried. There was a gentle tap at the door, and a pretty chambermaid, putting in her smiling face, inquired, with a hesitating air, whether I had rung. I understood it as a modest hint that it was time to retire. My dream of absolute dominion was at an end. So abdicating my throne, like a prudent potentate, to avoid being deposed, and putting the Stratford guide-book under my arm as a pillow companion, I went to bed, and dreamt all night of Shakespeare, the Jubilee, and David Garrick. The next morning was one of those quickening mornings, which we sometimes have in early spring, for it was about the middle of March. The chills of a long winter had suddenly given way, the north wind had spent its last gasp, and a mild air came stealing from the west, breathing the breath of life into nature, and wooing every bud and flower to burst forth into fragrance and beauty. I had come to Stratford on a poetical pilgrimage. My first visit was to the house where Shakespeare was born, and where, according to tradition, he was brought up to his father's craft of wool-combing. It is a small, mean-looking edifice of wood and plaster, a true nestling place of genius, which seems to delight in hatching its offspring in by corners. The walls of its squalid chambers are covered with names and inscriptions in every language by pilgrims of all nations, ranks, and conditions, from the prince to the peasant, and present a simple but striking instance of the spontaneous and universal homage of mankind to the great poet of nature. The house is shown by a garrulous old lady in a frosty red face, lighted up by a cold blue anxious eye, and garnished with artificial locks of flaxen hair, curling from under an exceedingly dirty cap. She was peculiarly assiduous in exhibiting the relics with which this like all other celebrated shrines, abounds. There was the shattered stock of the very matchlock with which Shakespeare shot the deer on his poaching exploits. There, too, was his tobacco-box, which proves that he was a rival smoker of Sir Walter Raleigh, the sword also with which he played Hamlet, and the identical lantern with which Friar Lawrence discovered Romeo and Juliet at the tomb. There was an ample supply also of Shakespeare's mulberry tree, which seems to have as extraordinary powers of self-multiplication as the wood of the true cross, of which there is enough extant to build a ship of the line. The most favorite object of curiosity, however, is Shakespeare's chair. It stands in a chimney nook of a small gloomy chamber, just behind what was his father's shop. Here he may many a time have sat when a boy, watching the slowly revolving spit with all the longing of an urchin, or of an evening listening to the cronies and gossips of Stratford, dealing forth churchyard tales and legendary anecdotes of the troublesome times of England. In this chair it is the custom of every one that visits the house to sit, whether this be done with the hope of imbibing any of the inspiration of the bard, I am at a loss to say. I merely mentioned the fact, and mine hostess privately assured me that, though built of solid oak, such was the fervent zeal of devotees, the chair had to be new-bottomed at least once in three years. It is worthy of notice also, in the history of this extraordinary chair, that it partakes something of the volatile nature of the Santa Casa of Loretto, or the flying chair of the Arabian enchanter. For, though sold some few years since to a northern princess, yet, strange to tell, it has found its way back again to the old chimney-corner. I am always of easy faith in such matters, 
and am ever willing to be deceived where the deceit is pleasant and costs nothing i am therefore a ready believer in relics legends and local anecdotes of goblins and great men and would advise all travellers who travel for their gratification to be the same what is it to us whether these stories be true or false so long as we can persuade ourselves into the belief of them and enjoy all the charm of the reality there is nothing like resolute good-humoured credulity in these matters and on this occasion i went even so far as willingly to believe the claims of mine hostess to a lineal descent from the poet when unluckily for my faith she put into my hands a play of her own composition which set all belief in her own consanguinity at defiance from the birthplace of shakespeare a few paces brought me to his grave he lies buried in the chancel of the parish church a large and venerable pile mouldering with age but richly ornamented it stands on the banks of the avon on an embowered point and separated by adjoining gardens from the suburbs of the town its situation is quiet and retired the river runs murmuring at the foot of the churchyard and the elms which grow upon its banks droop their branches into its clear bosom an avenue of limes the boughs of which are curiously interlaced so as to form in summer an arched way of foliage leads up from the gate of the yard to the church porch the graves are overgrown with grass the grey tombstones some of them nearly sunk into the earth are half covered with moss which has likewise tinted the reverend old building small birds have built their nests among the cornices and fissures of the walls and keep up a continual flutter and chirping and rooks are sailing and cawing about its lofty grey spire in the course of my rambles i met with the grey-headed sexton edmonds and accompanied him home to get the key of the church he had lived in stratford man and boy for eighty years and seemed still to consider himself a vigorous man with the trivial exception that he had nearly lost the use of his legs for a few years past his dwelling was a cottage looking out upon the avon and its bordering meadows and was a picture of that neatness order and comfort which pervade the humblest dwellings in this country a low whitewashed room with a stone floor carefully scrubbed served for parlour kitchen and hall rows of pewter and earthen dishes glittered along the dresser on an old oaken table well rubbed and polished lay the family bible and prayer book and the drawer contained the family library composed of about half a score of well-thumbed volumes an ancient clock that important article of cottage furniture ticked on the opposite side of the room with a bright warming pan hanging on one side of it and the old man's horn-handled sunday cane on the other the fireplace as usual was wide and deep enough to admit a gossip knot within its jams in one corner sat the old man's granddaughter sewing a pretty blue-eyed girl and in the opposite corner was a superannuated crony whom he addressed by the name of john ange and who i found had been his companion from childhood they had played together in infancy they had worked together in manhood they were now tottering about and gossiping away the evening of life and in a short time they will probably be buried together in the neighboring churchyard it is not often that we see two streams of existence running thus evenly and tranquilly side by side it is only in such quiet bosom scenes of life that they are to be met with i had hoped to gather some traditionary anecdotes of the bard from these ancient chroniclers but they had nothing new to impart the long interval during which shakespeare's writings lay in comparative neglect has spread its shadow over his history and it is his good or evil lot that scarcely anything remains to his biographers but a scanty handful of conjectures the sexton and his companion had been employed as carpenters on the preparations for the celebrated stratford jubilee and they remembered garrick the prime mover of the fete who superintended the arrangements and who according to the sexton 
was a short punch man very lively and bustling john ange had assisted also in cutting down shakespeare's mulberry tree of which he had a morsel in his pocket for sale no doubt a sovereign quickener of literary conception i was grieved to hear these two worthy whites speak very dubiously of the elegant dame who shows the shakespeare house john ange shook his head when i mentioned her valuable and inexhaustible collection of relics particularly her remains of the mulberry tree and the old sexton even expressed a doubt as to shakespeare having been born in her house i soon discovered that he looked upon her mansion with an evil eye as a rival to the poet's tomb the latter having comparatively but few visitors thus it is that historians differ at the very outset and mere pebbles make the stream of truth diverge into different channels even at the fountain head we approached the church through the avenue of limes and entered by a gothic porch highly ornamented with carved doors of massive oak the interior is spacious and the architecture and embellishments superior to those of most country churches there are several ancient monuments of nobility and gentry over some of which hang funeral as cutcheons and banners dropping piecemeal from the walls the tomb of shakespeare is in the chancel the place is solemn and sepulchral tall elms wave before the pointed windows and the avon which runs at a short distance from the walls keeps up a low perpetual murmur a flat stone marks the spot where the bard is buried there are four lines inscribed on it said to have been written by himself and which have in them something extremely awful if they are indeed his own they show that solicitude about the quiet of the grave which seems natural to fine sensibilities and thoughtful minds good friend for jesus sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here blessed be he that spares these stones and cursed be he that moves my bones just over the grave in a niche of the wall is a bust of shakespeare put up shortly after his death and considered as a resemblance the aspect is pleasant and serene with a finely arched forehead and i thought i could read in it clear indications of that cheerful social disposition by which he was as much characterized among his contemporaries as by the vastness of his genius the inscription mentions his age at the time of his decease fifty-three years an untimely death for the world for what fruit might not have been expected from the golden autumn of such a mind sheltered as it was from the stormy vicissitudes of life and flourishing in the sunshine of popular and royal favor the inscription on the tombstone has not been without its effect it has prevented the removal of its remains from the bosom of his native place to westminster abbey which was at one time contemplated a few years since also as some laborers were digging to make an adjoining vault the earth caved in so as to leave a vacant space almost like an arch through which one might have reached into his grave no one however presumed to meddle with his remains so awfully guarded by a malediction unless any of the idle or the curious or any collector of relics should be tempted to commit depredations the old sexton kept watch over the place for two days until the vault was finished and the aperture closed again he told me that he had made bold to look in at the hole but could see neither coffin nor bones nothing but dust it was something i thought to have seen the dust of shakespeare next to this grave are those of his wife his favorite daughter mrs hall and others of his family on a tomb close by also is a full-length effigy of his old friend john combe of usurious memory of whom he is said to have written a ludicrous epitaph there are other monuments around but the mind refuses to dwell on anything that is not connected with shakespeare his idea pervades the place the whole pile seems but as his mausoleum the feelings no longer checked and thwarted by doubt here indulge in perfect confidence other traces of him may be false or dubious 
but here is palpable evidence and absolute certainty as i trod the sounding pavement there was something intense and thrilling in the idea that in very truth the remains of shakespeare were mouldering beneath my feet it was a long time before i could prevail upon myself to leave the place and as i passed through the churchyard i plucked a branch from one of the yew trees the only relic that i have brought from stratford i had now visited the usual objects of a pilgrim's devotion but i had a desire to see the old family seat of the lucys at charlecot and to ramble through the park where shakespeare in company with some of the roisterers of stratford committed his youthful offence of deer-stealing in this hare-brained exploit we are told that he was taken prisoner and carried to the keeper's lodge where he remained all night in doleful captivity when brought into the presence of sir thomas lucy his treatment must have been galling and humiliating for it so wrought upon his spirit as to produce a rough pasquinade which was affixed to the park gate at charlotte co footnote the following is the only stanza extant of this lampoon a parliament member a justice of peace at home a poor scarecrow at london an ass if lozy is lucy as some volk miscall it then lucy is lozy whatever befall it he thinks himself great yet an ass in his state we allow by his ears but with asses to mate if lucy is lozy as some volk miscall it then sing lousy lucy whatever befall it End of footnote. this flagitious attack upon the dignity of the knight so incensed him that he applied to a lawyer at warwick to put the severity of the laws in force against the rhyming deer-stalker shakespeare did not wait to brave the united puissance of a knight of the shire and a country attorney he forthwith abandoned the pleasant banks of the avon and his paternal trade wandered away to london became a hanger-on to the theatres then an actor and finally wrote for the stage and thus through the persecution of sir thomas lucy stratford lost an indifferent wool comber and the world gained an immortal poet he retained however for a long time a sense of the harsh treatment of the lord of charlico and revenged himself in his writings but in the sportive way of a good-natured mind sir thomas is said to be the original of justice shallow and the satire is slyly fixed upon him by the justice's armorial bearings which like those of the knight had white looses in the quarterings footnote the loose is a pike or jack and abounds in the avon about charlico End quote. End of footnote. various attempts have been made by his biographers to soften and explain away this early transgression of the poet but i look upon it as one of those thoughtless exploits natural to his situation and turn of mind shakespeare when young had doubtless all the wildness and irregularity of an ardent undisciplined and undirected genius the poetic temperament is naturally something in it of the vagabond when left to itself it runs loosely and wildly and delights in everything eccentric and licentious it is often a turn-up of a die and the gambling freaks of fate whether a natural genius shall turn out a great rogue or a great poet and had not shakespeare's mind fortunately taken a literary bias he might have as daringly transcended all civil as he has all dramatic laws i have little doubt that in early life when running like an unbroken colt about the neighbourhood of stratford he was to be found in the company of all kinds of odd anomalous characters they associated with all the madcaps of the place and was one of those unlucky urchins at mention of whom old men shake their heads and predict that they will one day come to the gallows to him the poaching in sir thomas lucy's park was doubtless like a foray to a scottish knight and struck his eager and as yet untamed imagination as something delightfully adventurous footnote a proof of shakespeare's random habits and associates in his youthful days 
may be found in a traditionary anecdote picked up at stratford by the elder ireland and mentioned in his picturesque views on the avon End of footnote. about seven miles from stratford lies the thirsty little market town of bedford famous for its ale two societies of the village yeomanry used to meet under the appellation of the bedford toppers to challenge the lovers of good ale of the neighboring villages to a contest of drinking among others the people of stratford were called out to prove the strength of their heads and in the number of the champions was shakespeare who in spite of the proverb that they who drink beer will think beer was as true to his ale as falstaff to his sack the chivalry of stratford was staggered at the first onset and sounded a retreat while they had yet the legs to carry them off the field they had scarcely marched a mile when their legs failing them they were forced to lie down under a crab tree where they passed the night it was still standing and goes by the name of shakespeare's tree in the morning his companions awake the bard and proposed returning to bedford but he declined saying he had enough having drank with piping bepworth dancing marston haunted hillbro hungry grafton dudging exhall papist wixford beggarly broom and drunken bedford the villages here alluded to says ireland still bear the epithets thus given them the people of pebworth are still famed for their skill on the pipe and tabor hillborough is now called haunted hillborough and grafton is famous for the poverty of its soil the old mansion of charlecot and its surrounding park still remain in the possession of the lucy family and are a peculiarly interesting front being connected with this whimsical but eventful circumstance in the scanty history of the bard as the house stood at little more than three miles distance from stratford i resolved to pay it a pedestrian visit that i might stroll leisurely through some of the scenes from which shakespeare must have derived his earliest ideas of rural imagery the country was yet naked and leafless but english scenery is always verdant and the sudden change in the temperature of the weather was surprising in its quickening effects upon the landscape it was inspiring and animating to witness this first awakening of spring to feel its warm breath stealing over the senses to see the moist mellow earth beginning to put forth the green sprout and the tender blade and the trees and shrubs and the reviving tints and bursting buds giving the promise of returning foliage and flower the cold snowdrop the little borderer on the skirts of winter was to be seen with its chaste white blossoms in the small gardens before the cottages the bleating of the new-dropped lambs was faintly heard from the fields the sparrow twittered about the thatched eaves and budding hedges the robin threw a livelier note into his late querulous wintry strain and the lark springing up from the reeking bosom of the meadow towered away into the bright fleecy cloud pouring forth torrents of melody as i watched the little songster mounting up higher and higher until his body was a mere speck on the white bosom of the cloud while the ear was still filled with his music it called to mind shakespeare's exquisite little song in cymbeline hark hark the lark at heaven's gate sings and phoebus gins rise his steeds to water at those springs on chaliced flowers that lies and winking merry buds begin to ope their golden eyes with every thing that pretty been my lady sweet arise indeed the whole country about here is poetic ground everything is associated with the idea of shakespeare every old cottage that i saw i fancied into some resort of his boyhood where he had acquired his intimate knowledge of rustic life and manners and heard those legendary tales and wild superstitions which he has woven like witchcraft into his dramas for in his time we are told it was a popular amusement in winter evenings to sit round the fire and tell merry tales of errant knights queens lovers lords ladies giants dwarfs thieves cheaters witches fairies goblins and friars footnote scott 
in his discovery of witchcraft enumerates of those fireside fancies and they have so frayed us with host bull beggars spirits witches urchins elves hags fairies satyrs pans fauns sirens kit with the can stick tritons centaurs dwarfs giants imps calcars conjurers nymphs changelings incubus robin goodfellow the sporn the mare the man in the oak the hellwain the fire drake the puckle tom thumb hobgoblins tom tumbler boneless and such other bugs that we were afraid of our own shadows End of footnote. my route for a part of the way lay in sight of the avon which made a variety of the most fancy doublings and windings through a wide and fertile valley sometimes glittering from among willows which fringed its borders sometimes disappearing among groves or beneath green banks and sometimes rambling out into full view and making an azure sweep round a slope of meadow land this beautiful bosom of country is called the vale of the red horse a distant line of undulating blue hills seems to be its boundary whilst all the soft intervening landscape lies in a manner enchained in the silver links of the avon after pursuing the road for about three miles i turned off into a footpath which led along the borders of fields and under hedgerows to a private gate of the park there was a stile however for the benefit of the pedestrian there being a public right-of-way through the grounds i delight in these hospitable estates in which every one has a kind of property at least as far as the footpath is concerned it in some measure reconciles a poor man to his lot and what is more to the better lot of his neighbor thus to have parks and pleasure grounds thrown open for his recreation he breathes the pure air as freely and lolls as luxuriously under the shade as the lord of the soil and if he has not the privilege of calling all that he sees his own he has not at the same time the trouble of paying for it and keeping it in order i now found myself among noble avenues of oaks and elms whose vast size bespoke the growth of centuries the wind sounded solemnly among their branches and the rooks cawed from their hereditary nests in the tree-tops the eye ranged through a long lessening vista with nothing to interrupt the view but a distant statue and a vagrant deer stalking like a shadow across the opening there is something about these stately old avenues that has the effect of gothic architecture not merely from the pretended similarity of form but from their bearing the evidence of long duration and of having had their origin in a period of time with which we associate ideas of romantic grandeur they betoken also the long settled dignity and proudly concentrated independence of an ancient family and i have heard a worthy but aristocratic old friend observe when speaking of the sumptuous palaces of modern gentry that money could do it much with stone and mortar but thank heaven there was no such thing as suddenly building up an avenue of oaks it was from wandering in early life among this rich scenery and about the romantic solitudes of the adjoining park of fulbrook which then formed a part of the lucy estate that some of shakespeare's commentators have supposed he derived his noble forest meditations of jacques and the enchanting woodland pictures in as you like it it is in lonely wanderings through such scenes that the mind drinks deep but quiet draughts of inspiration and becomes intensely sensible of the beauty and majesty of nature the imagination kindles into reverie and rapture vague but exquisite images and ideas keep breaking upon it and we revel in a mute and almost incommunicable luxury of thought it was in some such mood and perhaps under one of those very trees before me which threw their broad shades over the grassy banks and quivering waters of the avon that the poet's fancy may have sallied forth into that little song which breathes the very soul of a rural voluptuary unto the greenwood tree who loves to lie with me and tune his merry throat unto the sweet bird's note come hither come hither come hither here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather 
I had now come in sight of the house. It is a large building of brick with stone coins, and is in the Gothic style of Queen Elizabeth's day, having been built in the first year of her reign. The exterior remains very nearly in its original state, and may be considered a fair specimen of the residence of a wealthy country gentleman of those days. A great gateway opens from the park into a kind of courtyard in front of the house, ornamented with a grass plot, shrubs, and flower beds. The gateway is an imitation of the ancient barbican, being a kind of outpost and flanked by towers, though evidently for mere ornament instead of defense. The front of the house is completely in the old style, with stone-shafted casements, a great bow window of heavy stonework, and a portal with armorial bearings over it carved in stone. At each corner of the building is an octagon tower surmounted by a gilt ball and weather cock. The Avon, which winds through the park, makes a bend just at the foot of a gently sloping bank which sweeps down from the rear of the house. Large herds of deer were feeding or reposing upon its borders, and swans were sailing majestically upon its bosom. As I contemplated the venerable old mansion, I called to mind Falstaff's encomium on Justice Shallow's abode, and the affected indifference and real vanity of the latter. Falstaff, you have a goodly dwelling, and a rich, shallow, barren, 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 beggars all, beggars all, Sir John. Marry, good heir. Whatever may have been the joviality of the old mansion in the days of Shakespeare, it now had an air of stillness and solitude. The great iron gateway that opened into the courtyard was locked. There was no show of servants bustling about the place. The deer gazed quietly at me as I passed, being no longer harried by the moss troopers of Stratford. The only sign of domestic life that I met with was a white cat stealing with weary look and stealthy pace towards the stables, as if on some nefarious expedition. I must not admit to mention the carcass of a scoundrel crow, which I saw suspended against the barn wall, as it shows that the Lucy still inherit that lordly abhorrence of poachers, and maintain that rigorous exercise of territorial power which was so strenuously manifested in the case of the bard. After prowling about for some time, I at length found my way to a lateral portal, which was the everyday entrance to the mansion. I was courteously received by a worthy old housekeeper, who, with the civility and communicativeness of her order, showed me the interior of the house. The greater part has undergone alterations and been adapted to modern tastes and modes of living. There is a fine old oaken staircase, and the great hall, that noble feature in an ancient manor house, still retains much of the appearance it must have had in the days of Shakespeare. The ceiling is arched and lofty, and at one end is a gallery in which stands an organ. The weapons and trophies of the chase, which formerly adorned the hall of a country gentleman, have made way for family portraits. There is a wide, hospitable fireplace, calculated for an ample old-fashioned wood fire, formerly the rallying place of winter festivity. On the opposite side of the hall is the huge Gothic bow window, with stone shafts, which looks out upon the courtyard. Here are emblazoned in stained glass the armorial bearings of the Lucy family for many generations, some being dated in 1558. I was delighted to observe in the quarterings the three white luces by which the character of Sir Thomas was first identified with that of Justice Shallow. They are mentioned in the first scene of the Merry Wives of Windsor, where the Justice is in a rage with Falstaff for having beaten his men, killed his deer, and broken into his lodge. The poet had no doubt the offences of himself and his comrades in mind at the time, and we may suppose the family pride and vindictive threats of the Poussant Shallow to be a caricature of the pompous indignation of Sir Thomas. Shallow, Sir Hugh, persuade me not. I will make a star chamber matter of it. If he were twenty John Falstaffs, he shall not abuse Sir Robert Shallow, Esquire. Slender, in the county of Gloucester, Justice of Peace and Quorum. Shallow, I, Cousin Slender, and Custolorium. Slender, I, and Ratalorum too, and a gentleman born, Master Parson. 
who writes himself armigero in any bill warrant quittance or obligation armigero shallow i that i do and have done any time these three hundred years slender all his successors gone before him have done it and all his ancestors that came after him may they may give the dozen white looses in their coat shallow the council shall hear it it is a riot evans it is not meet the council hear of a riot there is no fear of got in a riot the council hear you shall desire to hear the fear of got and not to hear a riot take your visiments in that shallow ha o oh my life if i were young again the sword shall end it near the window thus emblazoned hung a portrait by sir peter lely of one of the lucy family a great beauty of the time of charles the second the old housekeeper shook her head as she pointed to the picture and informed me that this lady had been sadly addicted to cards and had gambled away a great portion of the family estate among which was that part of the park where shakespeare and his comrades had killed the deer the lands thus lost had not been entirely regained by the family even at the present day it is but justice to this recreant dame to confess that she had a surpassingly fine hand and arm the picture which most attracted my attention was a great painting over the fireplace containing likenesses of sir thomas lucy and his family who inhabited the hall in the latter part of shakespeare's lifetime i at first thought that it was the vindictive knight himself but the housekeeper assured me that it was his son the only likeness extant of the former being an effigy upon his tomb in the church of the neighboring hamlet of charlecot footnote this effigy is in white marble and represents the knight in complete armor near him lies the effigy of his wife and on her tomb is the following inscription which if really composed by her husband places him quite above the intellectual level of master shallow here lieth the lady joyce lucy wife of sir thomas lucy of charlotte in ye county of warwick knight daughter and heir of thomas acton of sutton in ye county of worcester esquire who departed out of this wretched world to her heavenly kingdom ye ten day of february in ye year of our lord god fifteen ninety five and of her age sixty and three all the time of her life a true and faithful servant of her good god never detected of any crime or vice in religion most sound in love to her husband most faithful and true in friendship most constant to what in trust was committed unto her most secret in wisdom excelling in governing of her house bringing up of youth in ye fear of god that did converse with her most rare and singular a great maintainer of hospitality greatly esteemed of her betters misliked of none and less of the envious when all is spoken that can be said a woman so garnished with virtue is not to be bettered and hardly to be equalled by any as she lived most virtuously so she died most godly set down by him yet best did know what hath been written to be true thomas lucy End of footnote. the picture gives a lively idea of the costume and manners of the time sir thomas is dressed in rough and doublet white shoes with roses in them and has a peaked yellow or as master slender would say a cane-coloured beard his lady is seated on the opposite side of the picture in white ruff and long stomacher and the children have a most venerable stiffness and formality of dress hounds and spaniels are mingled in the family group a hawk is seated on his perch in the foreground and one of the children holds a bow all intimating the knight's skill in hunting hawking and archery so indispensable to an accomplished gentleman in those days footnote bishop earl speaking of the country gentlemen of his time observes his housekeeping is seen much in the different families of dogs and serving men attendant on their kennels and the deepness of their throats is the depth of his discourse a hawk he esteems the true burden of nobility and is exceedingly ambitious to seem delighted with the sport and have his fist gloved with his jesses in gilpin 
in his description of a Mr. Hastings, remarks, He kept all sorts of hounds that run buck, fox, hare, otter, and badger, and had hawks of all kinds, both long and short-winged. His great hall was commonly strewed with marrow-bones, and full of hawk-perches, hounds, spaniels, and terriers, on a broad hearth, paved with brick, lay some of the choicest terriers, hounds, and spaniels. End of footnote. I regretted to find that the ancient furniture of the hall had disappeared, for I had hoped to meet with the stately elbow chair of carved oak, in which the country squire of former days was wont to sway the sceptre of empire over his rural domains, and in which it might be presumed the redoubled Sir Thomas sat enthroned in awful state when the recreant Shakespeare was brought before him. As I liked to deck out pictures for my own entertainment, I pleased myself with the idea that this very hall had been the scene of the unlucky bard's examination on the morning after his captivity in the lodge. I fancied to myself the rural potentate, surrounded by his bodyguard of butler, pages, and blue-coated serving-men, with their badges, while the luckless culprit was brought in, forlorn and chop-fallen, in the custody of gamekeepers, huntsmen, and whippers in, followed by a rabble rout of country clowns. I fancied bright faces of curious housemaids peeping from the half-open doors, while from the gallery the fair daughters of the night leaned gracefully forward, eyeing the youthful prisoner with that pity that dwells in womanhood. Who would have thought that this poor violet, thus trembling before the brief authority of a country squire, and the sport of rustic boars, was soon to become the delight of princes, the theme of all tongues and ages, the dictator to the human mind, and was to confer immortality on his oppressor by a character and a lampoon. I was now invited by the butler to walk into the garden, and I felt inclined to visit the orchard and harbour where the justice treated Sir John Falstaff, and Cousin Silence to a last year's pippin of his own grafting, with a dish of caraways. But I had already spent so much of the day in my ramblings, that I was obliged to give up any further investigations. When about to take my leave, I was gratified by the civil entreaties of the housekeeper and butler, that I would take some refreshment, an instance of good old hospitality which, I grieve to say, we castle hunters seldom meet with in modern days. I make no doubt it is a virtue which the present representative of the Lucys inherits from his ancestors, for Shakespeare, even in his character, makes just as shallow importunate in this respect, as witness his pressing instances to Falstaff. By cock and pie, sir, you shall not away to-night. I will not excuse you. You shall not be excused. Excuses shall not be admitted. There is no excuse shall serve. You shall not be excused. Some pigeons, Davy, a couple of short-legged hens, a joint of mutton, and any pretty little tiny kickshaws, tell William Cook. I now bade a reluctant farewell to the old hall. My mind had become so completely possessed by the imagery scenes and characters connected with it, that I seemed to be actually living among them. Everything brought them as it were before my eyes, and as the door of the dining-room opened, I almost expected to hear the feeble voice of Master Silence wavering forth his favorite ditty. "'Tis merry in hall, when beards wag all, and welcome, merry shrove tide." On returning to my inn, I could not but reflect on the singular gift of the poet, to be able thus to spread the magic of his mind over the very face of nature, to give to things and places a charm and character not their own, and to turn this working-day world into a perfect fairyland. He is indeed the true enchanter, whose spell operates not upon the senses, but upon the imagination and the heart. Under the wizard influence of Shakespeare, I had been walking all day in a complete delusion. I had surveyed the landscape through the prism of poetry, which tinged every object with the hues of the rainbow. I had been surrounded with fancied beings, with mere airy nothing as conjured up by poetic power, yet which to me had all the charm of reality. I had heard Jacques soliloquize beneath his oak, had beheld the fair Rosalind and her companion adventuring through the woodlands and above all, had been once more present in spirit with fat Jack Falstaff, 
and his contemporaries, from the august Justice Shallow down to the gentle Master Slender and the sweet Anne Page. Ten thousand honors and blessings on the bard who has thus gilded the dull realities of life with innocent illusions, who has spread exquisite and unbought pleasures in my checkered path, and beguiled my spirit in many a lonely hour with all the cordial and cheerful sympathies of social life. As I crossed the bridge over the Avon on my return, I paused to contemplate the distant church in which the poet lies buried, and could not but exult in the malediction which has kept his ashes undisturbed in its quiet and hallowed vaults. What honor could his name have derived from being mingled in dusty companionship with the epitaphs and escutcheons and venal eloquiums of a titled multitude? What would a crowded corner in Westminster Abbey have been, compared with this reverend pile, which seems to stand in beautiful loneliness as his sole mausoleum? The solitude about the grave may be but the offspring of an overwrought sensibility. But human nature is made up of foibles and prejudices, and its best and tenderest affections are mingled with these factitious feelings. He who has sought renown about the world, and has reaped a full harvest of worldly favor, will find, after all, that there is no love, no admiration, no applause, so sweet to the soul as that which springs up in his native place. It is there that he seeks to be gathered in peace and honor among his kindred, and his early friends. And when the weary heart and failing head begin to warn him that the evening of life is drawing on, he turns as finally as does the infant to the mother's arms, to sink to sleep in the bosom of the scene of his childhood. How would it have cheered the spirit of the youthful bard, when, wandering forth in disgrace upon a doubtful world, he cast back a heavy look upon his paternal home? Could he have foreseen that before many years he should return to it covered with renown, that his name should become the boast and glory of his native place, that his ashes should be religiously guarded as its most precious treasure, and that its lessening spire, in which his eyes were fixed in tearful contemplation, should one day become the beacon towering amidst the gentle landscape to guide the literary pilgrim of every nation to his tomb. End of chapter 6 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida End of Washington Irving's Visit to England by Washington Irving